might do the uh, prayer list before we sleep. Okay. Just to stall oh, another bit. Okay. 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 email list this afternoon late but we had a few more come in uh, Pete is home with a bad cold Gary uh, I believe was going to go get a COVID test today he had a rough night last night Frank Hance was having some symptoms and was going to get a COVID test today and um Ira and Gary and Frank all went over and helped Miss Gwen clean up her yard and get leaves up and some wood up and all that sort of thing. And without knowing she was, she tested positive. So we don't know if any of those guys are coming down with it from that or not. But remember Miss Gwen, uh, please. And Mike has a cold and a cough. Um, Don and Rose are home tonight with a cold, and Randy Holloway has a cold, and Carol is back on chemo pills, and this round seems to be hitting her harder than the previous times that she's taken it, so she asked prayer. Um, David Ballard is in the hospital. He has cancer, and he has covid Joy's aunt, Ruby Carson, in her 80s, is in the hospital up at uh, Boone. And she's uh, showing a lot of signs of dementia. Um, Pete's cousin, George Covington, was my neighbor growing up, is the same age as Pete. There were several of those boys in that family, but uh, George is the one that's the same age as Pete. And he's got uh, two or three issues with his heart and he's having his kidneys are not functioning as well as they should. So he was going to the doctors in the hospital and have tests run. Fellow who was a member of this church for a little while is named Ron Zavicki. Uh, him and Wendy moved up here from Florida years ago and um, came to church here. And then they moved back to Florida for a while. And um, Ron is, um, and then they came back. Ron is in the hospital with his heart. Um, Debbie and Charles Holland have cancer, of course. Wayne Connor, Steve Williams, uh, Carol Holloway, O. Tyson is going to begin her chemo real soon, and uh, she'll have a, a, a series um, for about um, six or seven. Heard of, that they'll be effective. Kathy Gibson, stage four cancer. <clears throat> Lynn Ross. And Florence both have vertigo. Tina Templeton, Diane Hudler has liver disease. Tommy Nance has cancer. Tammy and Pat Munn. Tammy's coming up within the next um, about another week or so. She'll have that appointment with the brain doctor. 
Um, there's several in the church that have back issues that we've been praying for with severe back pains. Several that have COPD breathing issues that affect their heart. And several that have spiritual needs. And most of you are very aware with the news today of what else is going on in Washington, D.C., and we really need to pray for our nation. Um, I don't have an answer. You know, there's no easy solutions to any of this stuff that's been going on ever since all the riots in the streets with the Black Lives Matter and all that. I mean, there, there's been no easy explanations for any of this stuff. And, uh, and there's no easy explanation for what's happening now. So um, just pray for the nation, pray for the Lord's intervention, pray for God to be in charge and, and work things for what's good for God's people and uh, for our protection and our safety and provision. And we want to be faithful to lift each other up. All right, let's pray, and then we'll sing a song. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that we can bring our needs and petitions to you. Thank you for this list of folks that we've mentioned again. And there's even more that we mailed out about today that have been on the long-term prayer list. Father, we, uh, we know what it's like to be sick. We know what it's like to hurt. We know what it's like to have concerns about our health in, in light of... Uh, of living and and leaving our loved ones behind and all those kind of things. So we lift this list up to you and pray for your help and your intervention. We praise you and thank you that you're in charge and you're on the throne and that you're our God and we can bring our needs to you. So bless these people, we pray, with health and strength and deliverance and bless the service tonight and those watching at home. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to see Diane Westbrook back after being in the hospital with pneumonia. And uh, good to see all of you. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, songbook, page 257. Jesus. <clears throat> Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him o'er and o'er. <coughs> Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Let's sing the last. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Amen. Thank you very much. Everybody get a copy of the outline. <clears throat> Did anybody else have a prayer request that we didn't mention tonight? Okay. We went over a pretty good list there. Proverbs chapter 12 and 13 tonight. We're in chapter 13, but we're going to refer back to chapter 12 in a couple of points that uh, duplicate in these two chapters together the contrast of righteousness and wickedness and our 
Schofield Bibles show that in chapter 12 and chapter 13, and it says continued. And uh, in verse in chapter 14, it says the contrast of goodness and evil continued, but very similar uh, contrast there. Verse chapter 13, verse 1, a wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Now we can listen without hearing. I sat in high school and, and uh, would listen to the teachers to get prepared for a test. And uh, I wanted to, I was very fortunate that I went through 12 years of, of school and um, didn't, never did fail a grade. And several of the guys that I hung around with all the time, my friends, um, most of them had failed at least one grade. And so I was one of the youngest graduates of the people I hung around with. I was only 17 when I graduated high school. And it was uh, very fortunate that I didn't, didn't fail any grades. And, um, but I, I didn't learn um, anything compared to other things that I did learn from. I learned the basics of reading and writing and arithmetic and, and uh, basic English and things of that nature, but uh, I didn't learn any depths from school. I also didn't when I went to junior college. I, I went to a business college and studied business administration, and I made good grades there, but I didn't learn a whole lot. But um, I went to technical school after that, and took welding. And I really had a desire to learn how to weld. I worked on a construction job where I was working with a welder and I would learn from him and I took classes and I would put extra effort. I would ask questions. I really wanted to learn and I did a lot of practicing on my own. And so um, I really picked that up quickly and became a certified welder in a in really rather short period of time because of uh, the concentration of wanting to learn what I was being taught and listening. And I did the same thing in Bible college. When I went to Bible college, I didn't go there to go to college so much. I went there to get trained on how to be a pastor. And so I listened intently to my teachers I read additional things. I took classes I didn't have to take because I wanted to learn everything I could possibly learn because I knew I was going to be responsible to God in being a pastor of a church. So I wanted to learn what I was being taught. And so I listened intently. And, you know, we can hear people tell us things and it just doesn't really register very deeply. We can be interested in what somebody's saying, and we'll listen to it carefully. And Proverbs is saying that a, a wise son hears his father's instructions, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. To be a scorner, one uh, rejects correction. All learning involves instruction and correction. Um, teachers teach, they give instruction, and then they give tests so they can see if the students are learning and where they need to concentrate more effort. And a, a scorner is, is one who closes his ears to rebuke. You'll remember we've used um, in this study a couple of times the sons of Eli. Eli was the priest who uh, Samuel was raised under. And Eli had sons of his own whom he did not correct and they committed all kind of lewdness around the temple. And at times he rebuked them for what they did, but they didn't pay him any attention. And God destroyed his sons because of their sins. And when Eli heard, not only he was more concerned, not about his sons being killed, but he was more concerned that they lost the ark of God to the enemies. And he fell over and broke his neck because of the, the uh, ark being taken and um, all that they went through by rejecting the teachings. And, of course, we mentioned that Samuel was raised by Eli at the temple, but Samuel listened and Samuel learned and Samuel heard from God. 
and Eli interpreted for him how he should approach that and listening to the Lord, and he became a great man of God. Rebels reject correction, and they reap the reward of their error. We've seen a lot of young people grow up through this church in these years that we've been here now. Most of the young people who grew up in this church are great kids. They come from good families. They, uh, they get saved. They get baptized. They stay faithful in church. They learn the Bible. They, they grow through Master Club and the teen department, and they, they uh, make great progress spiritually, and they help other young people that are friends of theirs to come to church and that sort of thing. But we've had a few that have been real rebels, and it's not a blame to be laid on their parents or their grandparents or anything of that nature. Some of them have tried very hard, but some of those kids have just developed a, an attitude. They weren't going to be corrected. They weren't going to listen. They were like these the Bible refers to as the scorner who heareth not rebuke, and they have reaped... Uh, you know, all kinds of problems from their sins and brought heartbreak and shame on their families as a result of it. Number two, a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressors shall eat violence. Our mouths can produce uh, the fruit of righteousness or cause a war. Um, we can use the tongue to... Uh, to praise, or we can use it to um, curse or slander. And um, back in Proverbs 12, and beginning with verse 13 down through verse 19, scriptures refer to the lips of the wicked there. In um, verse 13, it says, The wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. A man shall be satisfied with the good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hand shall be rendered unto him. Light in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counselors of peace is joy. There shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. Verse 22 is the last verse. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. Now we've seen back in Proverbs 6, the things God hates. And one of those is a lying tongue. God hates lying lips. The lips of the wicked ensnare them, but the just comes out of trouble. Jesus taught that what comes out of the mouth is because of what is in the heart. In uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse uh, 34, Jesus speaking about the Pharisees and all. He said, O generation of vipers, in Matthew 12, verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, every idle word that men shall speak they shall give an account of in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. And then in chapter 15 and verse 18 of Matthew, those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands 
defileth not a man. You'll remember how the Pharisees were rebuking Jesus' disciples because they went through the fields and they stripped some of the grain and ate it as they walked. And that was lawful for the Jews to do that in crossing a man's property. They could take of the, the grain and eat it um, while they kept traveling. And um, they, uh, they did this, but they did not wash their hands. And the Pharisees had made it a part of the law to uh, wash hands before Jesus was rebuking them for that and saying it was not whether your hands were clean before you ate that defiled you. It was what came out from the heart that defiled men, and he listed all of these particular sins. Now, this is repeated in several places in the Scripture where the, the heart is, is wicked and, and deceitful with, uh, with those who are not saved, and what comes out of their mouth is normal um, that reveals what is in their heart. Words can either build something people up or it can tear people down. I, I read a story about Winston Churchill, who was uh, the, the head of the war for England in World War II, and he was in Parliament. And um, Winston Churchill was a very um, striking figure and a vocal person. And um, he was having an argument with Lady Astor, and um, she said, Mr. Churchill, if you were my husband, I'd put arsenic in your tea. He said, Madam, if I were your husband, I would drink it. And uh, Bessie Braddock was a member of parliament. She said, sir, you're drunk. He said, Madam, you're ugly. And tomorrow I'll be sober. <laughs> So he, um, he had a sharp tongue and a, a strong wit, and he um, has, was known for his speeches to motivate England to stay in the war even when they were in, in desperate straits. James spoke much about the tongue in, in the book of James and uh, spoke about the the, the tongue can bring a, a, a world of iniquity, uh, can, can start a fire that burned down, that all kinds of animals have been tamed, but the tongue has no man tamed. And uh, that's a great problem. We look now at uh, verse 3 and 4 in Proverbs 13. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. He that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Any go through life wishing and wanting for things, but they are not willing to put forth the effort that is required for them to have the things that they want. We all know that it takes uh, diligent, hard work to get ahead in life. Our area right here in, in York County has become, the cost of housing has become almost beyond what the normal middle class people can afford. Very difficult to find a, um, a home to purchase that is under $200,000. And... Um, the, any kind of neighborhood at all, any kind of uh, decent size and, and, and appearance of a home, um, two, 200000 up is sort of the average. They've been next door to us where we live, and uh, there's houses in that development, and about the cheapest one is about $275,000, and they go up to about $350,000. And um, uh, the only thing that is in favor of folks living in that kind of, of home is that the interest rate is so low right now. Because the interest rate is very low, there is the possibility of, of uh, you know, 
making a payment on a more expensive home because the rate is low enough for folks to uh, to live. I know a number of people that um, uh, have to rent because they just can't find a home that they can afford to purchase. Um, it takes hard work to get ahead in life in a job, and quite often it takes more than just working one job 40 hours a week to get ahead. It takes either working part-time and a full-time or a lot of overtime or both the husband and the wife both working full-time in order to um, survive in, in the economy that we live in in this day and time. The diligent compared to the slothful, this is the same from back in chapter 12, verse 24, the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Most of the time, people who work very hard and learn their trade so they can get ahead, um, it will show in their pay and in their promotions. They'll be the people that um, get to the top pay of their craft, and they'll be the kind of people that uh, make money for the company, so they will be the people that might get promoted or or get benefits, and um, that hard work can pay off in time. Um, but one who is lazy um, can have serious problems. Over in chapter 12, verse 27, the slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting. That man is precious. I can't imagine people animals and then not clean them to eat them. If you're not going to clean them to eat them, then why hunt them to start with? You know, no reason to go out there and kill animals for no reason. And um, I like to watch some of those shows from Alaska. And I'm amazed those people over there where the temperature gets down to 30 and 40 and 50 degrees below zero for months at a time, they have to, they, they live out in the wilderness areas. They have to hunt and trap and fish and they have to put that food up for the winter because they can't just take off when it's six foot of snow on the ground and 35 degrees below zero and go into a city that's 50, 75, 100 miles away. And so they, they work very hard at trapping for the furs to make clothes and to sail and to catch fish. And they cut the fish in half and hang them on poles and smoke them. They build a little house for them and they put in fire and, and smoke the fish so they can preserve it for the winter. And they do the same thing with meat. Most of them, a small family, if they can kill one big moose in the wintertime, that will last their family with enough meat for the whole winter. If they don't get a moose, then they need about three caribou, which are like deer, in order to have enough meat for the winter. And they put that up in, in various ways of preserving. They don't have a problem with freezing meat in the wintertime because it's so cold, they can just... Uh, build a, a, um, a lean-to thing outside, you know, where the animals can't get to it up on a, a little flat deck like 10, 12 feet in the air and just put the meat up there and it'll stay there. And when they need any, they can go up and get it down, you know, and uh, it'll stay frozen for the whole winter. But it takes a lot of work. It's, uh, it takes an effort. Um, and it certainly can be, you know, nasty and difficult to clean animals and deal with all the blood and the skins and all of that sort of thing. But if they want something good to eat in the wintertime, then, then they're going to put forth the effort that it takes. If they don't, they're going to be in very bad shape. Saw one young couple in that series of uh, the Yukon that uh, they tried making it for a winter and, and they ran out of food and they went hunting, and they couldn't find anything, and it finally got down to where they had just enough food for a couple of days left, and they decided they were going to have to leave. And they took what gas they had and their snowmobile, and they took off to try to break across country to, a, to get to a road. And it was going to take them about two days on the snowmobile to get there, 
and um, they just had enough food, you know, if they stopped to eat and, and make it, and hopefully they could get somewhere from, from there. And I thought, boy, that would be a tragic thing to freeze to death out there on the road somewhere if that snowmobile broke down or something of that nature, and that kind of thing does happen. Well, they were people that certainly worked hard, but uh, most of us would not put our family in harm's way like that to try to live in those kind of conditions. Um, by the way, all of those that are on television like that, they make anywhere from about $8,000 to $12,000 per episode that they're on television. All of these shows like the Alligator Hunters and the the uh, it goes all the way back to that woman that had eight kids, you know, Kate plus eight or something like that was the name of it. You know, they they get paid to be on uh, that kind of television, and uh, and that's how they uh, have enough money to survive in doing what they're doing. Well, we go back to uh, verse five of Proverbs thirteen: "The righteous keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner." The righteous doesn't like lying. He doesn't like uh, unrighteousness. Those who live righteously, their righteousness keeps them in the way. It's like a, it's like a, a boundary for a creek or a river. The boundaries keep the water in the, the running, the course. And our righteousness keeps us in the path of the straight and narrow. Um, righteousness keeps us on the straight and it uh, is a blessing to us, and we don't get out of the way. The sinner's wickedness overthrows him. Back in chapter 12, verse 21, there shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. So both of these chapters deal with these contrasts between righteousness and unrighteousness, between evil and wickedness and the the just who live for the Lord. Uh, Proverbs 13, verse 8 through 11, reminds us that life will have many twists and turns. Most all of us have lived life for quite some time, and we've experienced a lot of things in life, and we know that you can't absolutely count on what's going to happen next week or next month or next year. And we must always say, if it's the Lord's will, we're going to do this or we're going to do that. Chapter 13, verse 8, the ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. Rejoice that the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. We've seen in 2020 that... Um, we certainly can't count on things to progress or stay the same or anything of that nature. And most everybody was hoping when 2020 was over that things are going to be different. Uh, I, I, I've thought about that a number of times. and I'm wondering why, why do we think the ending of the year is going to automatically make everything better? It wasn't the year 2020 that was so bad. It was the circumstances that we were in. And those circumstances were not going to automatically change just because we rolled into a new year. Now, uh, we do hope that eventually they're going to get a handle on this virus and get this put behind us, and that's going to help take care of a lot of things. But uh, until that day comes, we've still got to be very careful. We've got to protect ourselves. We've got to guard. And um, it takes our riches to ransom us out of trouble. We often say the older people get is in their golden years. And I always remind everybody the reason they call it that is because you have to have the gold to give to the doctors when you get older. You have to go all the time. Uh, Mr. Pete been going to the doctor quite a bit. I to check up with his prostate the other day. He had cancer and he had um, radiation for that. And his test was almost completely zeroed out. So that was great. And uh, But he's got a cold and he's not feeling well. So remember him in prayer. And uh, we, uh, we face things in life um, that our wealth can help us. And that's why it's important to, to live within our means, 
to work and save and be prepared for the old rainy day fund for things that can happen because sure enough, they will happen. Things will break down. Um, water heaters can go out and heating and air conditioning can go out and the roof can start leaking. And there's all kinds of things that cost a lot of money that we've got to sort of be prepared as best we possibly can. And so it's um, important going through life that we recognize every day is by the grace of God that we seek his help to live and move and have our being. And as James said, we shouldn't say we're going to do this, this, and this in the next year. We should say if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or do that within the year. The Jews were carried into captivity in the Babylonian captivity, but they left the poorest of the people behind. The, the Babylonians didn't take them captive in 2 Kings 25, 12. They left the poor there to keep the orchards so that when the enemy wanted to come back and take, that they could. And so the poor uh, actually had a blessing in, uh, in, in that. Uh, verse 9 tells us the Word of God is a, a light for our path, but the wicked is in darkness. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the wicked shall be put out. The unsaved are pictured as being in darkness, and they stumble at the way. The Christian has the Word of God to light his path so that his steps are safe and secure. We follow the Lord. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, um, we have His blessings. But if the unsaved don't have that, and they're walking following the course of this world, and it is leading them to the paths of destruction. Pride and danger can be a major issue. Verse 10 says, Only by pride cometh contention with the well-advised is wisdom. You remember, Satan motivating with Adam and Eve and how both Cain and Abel had the same parents, but Cain became a murderer. And um, we see the, the contentions that come and the dangers of the life following um, from the devil. Verse 12 says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it's a tree of life. Everybody has had some expectation that you had hope that something was going to take place. And when hope is deferred, when it doesn't come through, when it doesn't arrive when you think it ought to arrive, then there can be disappointment. Um, unfulfilled expectations bring about disappointments. But when the desire comes... There's rejoicing that it has come. In dealing with God, it's important that as Christians, we learn to have a patient spirit, that we wait upon the Lord. God does not work in a hurry like we do. We want things and we want it right now. We have to wait for the Lord and we have to be patient and long-suffering with people. And uh, if we are, then when the hope comes we can rejoice that it has transpired. I know many of you are hoping right now for that uh, that check to come in the mail from the stimulus thing, you know, and uh, go into the bank deposit or come in the mail. And uh, uh, we we uh, my wife looks at the mailbox every day. You know, we have a mailbox. It sets out uh, about I don't know 50 feet from the front door, probably or so. And she walks out there and checks the mailbox in the middle of a cul-de-sac. And, uh, and she likes to go check the mail. And um, she'll bring me my mail and she'll get her mail. And most of the time what it is are solicitations for us to buy something, you know. And um, political things. Thank God all that's pretty much over now. And... and um, the first of the years here, so we're not seeing quite as many commercials about uh, Medicare and Medicare supplement policies and all that sort of thing. I was so tired of hearing those and seeing those. I was 
anxious for that to be over with for another year. But we, uh, we look for good things to come, and we hope for good things. And um, it's important that we have patience. It's of great value to us. Verse 13 and 14. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. I learned that verse a long, many years ago, and I've thought about it many times as I've dealt with, with people who uh, get into sinful problems. The way of the transgressor is hard. We know we reap what we sow, but people uh, often like to put that out of their mind until it happens. And um, then they reap some hard thing because of their transgression. Good understanding gives favor. And we need favor with God and with man. And if we walk with the Lord, we can have that. God will not only bless us with His favor, but He'll give us favor with men if we live according to His Word. The, uh, I call it the brick wall that the transgressor knocks them down and they learn something. And uh, it takes that for a lot of people. The fools create their own folly. But a wise man is cautious and hearkens unto warnings. And the fool is rash and self-willed. And it's important that he learns from his mistakes or he's going to continue to make them over and over. Verse 17 says, A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is help. Integrity and intelligence are blessings to a person who puts their trust in someone. If you uh, have someone you trust and you can count on, it's, uh, it's of great value to you that they have integrity and honesty and, and you can believe them and count on them. But a wicked messenger falls into mischief and cannot be trusted. And that is um, a tragic uh, end that some come to. Verse 18 says, Poverty and shame uses the instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be. <clears throat> We've all met some people who were with alls. You can't tell them anything. They think they know everything. They got all the answers, and they won't be corrected. They won't uh, listen to uh, rebuke or instruction. But if uh, a person humbles themselves, and listens to others to, um, to be trusted and, and, and believe and make progress. Verse 19, the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is abomination to fools to depart from evil. You know, it's, it's a nice feeling to do a good job and feel personal satisfaction that you accomplished what you were trying to achieve. It can be planning things. It can be building something. It can be doing technical work on a computer. And, but there's a satisfaction about doing a good job. And reward can come from that. But the foolish can uh, find many problems. In Proverbs, back all the way back in chapter 4, in verse 14 through 17 says, Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of the evil men. By it, turn from it and pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. <clears throat> some, uh, some people can't sleep unless they have corrupted someone. And that's the way the wicked um, live their lives. Others. Back in chapter 13 and verse 20, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. 
You've heard me say many times that we're all affected by the people we spend time with. And if we spend time with good, godly people, we can be influenced by them and it will benefit us. We walk with wise men, we'll be wiser. We walk with godly men, we'll be better for it. I've told you all about my friend Everett Cooper that I enjoyed spending time with. And he was a godly man that I always felt more spiritual after being around him in a conversation or riding somewhere to a meeting together. But the companions of fools are going to be destroyed. Enoch walked with God and he had this testimony that he pleased God and God took him because he pleased God. Noah walked with God and he saved his family by building the ark. But all Noah and his family perished because they did not believe them that God was going to bring a judgment upon the earth. Evil hunts sinners like a, like a fox after a rabbit. But to the righteous, God shall repay. Verse 21 says, Evil pursueth sinners, but to the righteous, good shall be repaid. Thank God we have those promises that if we serve the Lord and live for God, we're going to reap from it. God's going to reward us for it. And we look forward to those things that He will do for us. Verse 22, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. A good man leaves his children, number one, a good name. A good name is, is rather to be chosen than, than silver. And um, but a good man, children and inheritance. But the sinner lives for himself, not concerned about leaving anything to their children, and they don't even leave their children a good name. The, the Canaanite people that were in the land that God gave to Abraham, all ten nations of the Canaanite people there, God was dissatisfied with and sought to destroy them and remove them from the land and give it back to Abraham's descendants, which is the nation of Israel. And that's important that righteousness is rewarded in that way. Verse 23, much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. Hard work can produce all that a family needs in a, in a small area of land. A half an acre garden can produce enough for a family to put up all the vegetables they would need for uh, the rest of the year if they work it right and keep the land good and keep the you know, leaves or fertilizer or whatever on it so that it will reproduce and, um, and it can produce for them if they work it hard. But a judgment can ruin even a great large farm. I've seen big farms go out of business because they get too much debt. They think if they borrow more money and plant more, some point in time that doesn't always work because you're paying the interest and you're paying back the principal. And so um, we knew a farm up in Ohio where the, um, they, they rent land from my daughter-in-law, Martha's family, to, um, to have, a dairy, they have a dairy barn. And they've bought some land from them to put in a second milking barn. And they have uh, 2,500 milk cows they milk three times a day. And it's a family-owned business. Their name is Vandermaid. They're from Holland. The old man and woman and their son and his wife came over from Holland and they established this dairy farm and they do an awful lot of the work themselves and they hire some workers and they have, have um, grown and prospered while some big corporate farms owned by big businesses have gone under trying to do the same thing they've been doing because they do a lot of the work themselves. They're not paying it all out in, uh, in wages and they're not uh, paying it all out for somebody else's rental of things. And so learning to uh, 
work hard for with what we have can accomplish something. Verse 24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth the times. It takes correction. It doesn't always take beating a kid to make them do right, but it takes some kind of correction all the time. And they need to understand there's a, a, um, a reaping for doing wrong. I think um, it's far more important that we teach them ethics and principles and morals and get them to obey those things than just the aspect of they disobeyed us or did something wrong. Proper correction can turn a child into the right direction of life. It's like bending a tree to get it to grow straight. And it's important that we guide our children in the way they grow. The wicked waste and are foolish with what they have. The righteous don't have to beg. God takes care of them. The wise are not wasteful. They lay up for bad times. We've seen people in life that uh, always have trouble, always have financial problems, always need somebody to help them. And then there's other people that don't seem to ever need that. And a lot of it has to do with the righteous life and the hard work ethic that the Bible teaches. I thank all of you for being here tonight. We... Uh, we want to continue to pray for all of these folks that have needs with COVID or sickness, with colds and the things that are going around. And all of you be careful and guard yourselves, please. And thank you for coming to be with the service tonight. Um, Miss Gwen, Miss Gwen, that's not Gwen, that's Diane. We mentioned Gwen and be sure to continue to pray for her and Mike. And uh, Miss Diane will play through something. If you need someone to pray with you or counsel with you, <clears throat> we'll give you a moment for that. And then Jason Wills, how about dismiss us in prayer as soon as Miss Diane plays a verse. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Okay, Jason, dismiss us if you would, please. Amen.